On this week's show, our panel talks with special guest Steve Miller, the CEO of International Automotive Components Group, about car and truck interiors and how the business has changed right along with them. Coming up next on AutoLine This Week. Underwriting for AutoLine This Week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine This Week. On today's show, we're going to put a spotlight on the supplier industry, especially the interior suppliers, and specifically a company called IAC. And that's because We've got the chairman and the CEO of that company, Steve Miller, here. And Steve, it's great to have you on this show. Thank you very much, John. Glad to be back. Joining us today also are Jeff Bennett from the Wall Street Journal and Tom Murphy from Ward's Auto. And great having the both of you here as Thank well. You. Thanks. Thanks much. Steve, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the interiors business. Total upheaval, the way I read it. Yes. You've got JCI Johnson Controls essentially saying, we're getting out of interiors. You've got a Chinese company, Young Feng, coming in and saying, hey, we'd love to buy all that from you. Magna, another supplier company saying, you know, we don't like supply interiors so much. You've got Grupo Antolin from Spain coming in and says, we'll take that, thank you very much. Why is there so much upheaval going on and what role is IAC going to play in interiors? <laughs> Well, a couple of things. One, uh, with all these changes you just described, uh, the interiors industry has morphed into having four dominant global players. And they're all in the, about the same size class as IAC. Uh, they're all uh, have global footprints, and that would, of course, be Yan Feng that you mentioned. It would be Grupo Antolin and uh, Forisha out of France and uh, IAC. So the, the industry just be in the last 24 months has greatly consolidated to a few large capable global players uh, who are very heavily invested in and focused on interiors. I think this is good news for the interiors business. Historically, interiors has been the lost leader. It's been the lowest margin business among all the auto uh, suppliers, much less than people who make uh, engine parts or brakes or electronics or whatever. So you guys say, why would you ever want to get into that business? Uh, the answer is uh, things are coming our way. One, the automakers want suppliers with global capability. Uh, they make their cars all over the world and they want suppliers who are positioned to have consistent uh, product technology and process technology in making the parts for them. People they can rely on all around and do one-stop shopping, if you will. Secondly, interiors are becoming vastly more important to cars. When I grew up, as you may, before your time, uh, <laughs> maybe not so much, <laughs> t tail fins was what sold cars. Today, cars you know, are basically aerodynamic packages around whatever is the interior configuration of the car. And what's left to please the customer, it is to have an interior uh, experience that is just luxurious and elegant. And I think you're going to see a lot more money spent on interiors uh, going forward uh, to create uh, that uh, sense of elegance. And while at the same time, having suppliers with the technology to take out weight and take out cost while at the same time creating a better uh, looking and feeling interior. So uh, between the globalization, the need for high technology, uh, I think uh, the interiors business is going to get better. And lastly, there is, the big players have so much investment in interiors, you can't give away this in order to get an order for some other kind of auto part. You've got to make your money here. And I think over time, that will raise the uh, margins in the interiors business. You mentioned growth in, in terms of IAC specifically you know, in the interiors business. Um, you've added, I think, 16 plants in China since 2006, 14 new plants around the world in the last two years. That's the sort of thing that triggers certain reactions from certain politicians, as you may notice. You know, that, that, that They like to talk about the investments happening outside of the United States, and, and yet your primary owner is an American businessman. So how do you respond to people who would say, well, why don't you do some of that more in the U.S.? The short answer on interiors is that interior components are bulky and very difficult to ship, uh, uh, both expensive to ship and you need protection. Think of an instrument panel. It's a huge piece of equipment, you know, with all the wires in it and everything else. And the cost of shipping that uh, basically requires that you put your plant within 100 miles of the assembly plant. 
And like it or not, most of the world's assembly plants are not in the U.S., they're all over the world. And if you want to be a global player, you've got to have your supply plants there. A second factor, even beyond the cost of shipping these things, is our customers want just in time. For example, for Volvo in Sweden, they give us four hours notice as to the color and all the components that are going to go into a particular instrument panel, and whether it's left-hand drive or right-hand drive and so on. You can't you know, make them in the U.S. and ship them over there. You need a plant right next door in order to keep up with the just-in-time requirement of the automaker customer. So what do you think has kind of become, I guess, the secret sauce for the four companies that remain as far as, you, you know, profit margins are pretty thin on these things, and it's intensive work that you have to do to meet these requirements. So I guess what is different now than, let's say, you know, five, ten years when you saw other companies out there and, and they folded up, why, why are you guys still able to generate the profits you are today versus back, back in the past? Well, uh, it, I mean, I, I won't say it's not a competitive industry. It certainly is, and there's a lot of pressure on margins for the even these remaining four global players. But uh, what's coming our way is the emphasis by the automakers on having absolute reliability uh, on a global scale to be able to supply them uh, when they need those parts and be able to bring them uh, with good launches on time so on. So that's that's one uh, characteristic. And secondly, is just the technology. I mean, it, you ought to go through our laboratories, where we are, you know, inventing the future, if you will, for how to make things half as heavy, half as thick, uh, but still have all the tactile and uh, appearance characteristics that you want for an excellent interior. And not everybody can do that. So that's why it's moving from a regional small player business into a, a business that's dominated by some very big players. Steve, you're a guy in the business known almost kind of like a gunslinger. I, I, I don't want to use that term, but sort of gun for hire in the sense that you're known as a turnaround artist. You've come in and turned a lot of companies around. You're known as a bankruptcy expert, having dealt with that. You've dealt with companies outside of the automotive industry. We're we could probably do a whole show just on your time at AIG and probably not get the full story because there's so much involved there. So my question is, why have you gone to IAC? Because uh, a lot of people in town are, are in, the, in the industry are asking us, is Steve there to sell it? Is Steve there because they're about to go through bankruptcy? What? Well, I know that was a big question when I came here, and it is a little bit of strange territory for me to come into a company that's basically healthy as opposed to being on their last legs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with IAC. It has come out of uh, zero 10 years ago, uh, out of the ruins of Collins and Aikman and then uh, picking up the interior business from Lear, uh, but has grown uh, at a very rapid pace over 10 years. It's 10 times the size now that it was uh, at the beginning when Wilbur Ross first made the investment. So this is a great company that I've come into. Why would I get into something that's already doing well? Uh, the short answer is I really wanted to come back to Detroit. This is where I spent the first uh, 25 years of my career at Ford and at Chrysler. Uh, I know all the people in this town. Uh, I married the lady who was running the Society of Automotive Engineers. So uh, this is kind of the perfect uh, place for me to be. I'm enjoying my life. I'm challenged by it and I'm planning to stay on indefinitely here. I don't have a short-term assignment to you know, pull the trigger and do anything. Um, uh, we're planning to stay. So there was an IPO attempt that, that never got off the ground, so can you speak to that? Is, is, is there still consideration for an IPO or perhaps a sale or, or even pieces yeah. of, of the properties? <clears throat> well, you can never say never to any uh, outcome here. Our owners are uh, include uh, Franklin Mutual and the Wilbur Ross uh, Holdings Group. And uh, they are private equity owners. They typically have a time horizon that's uh, actually less than a decade. They've been uh, patient with us because they're, they're not in any hurry to sell. But at some point, they may want to monetize their investment and move on to something else. The IPO was one of the possibilities that they looked at. Uh, the market uh, conditions didn't work for them. and. Uh, then they had a couple of years ago some uh, technical glitches that got in the way, so it made it not a good time. Uh, but uh, for right now, 
we have one single focus, and that is make this business as good as it can be. Well, based on that, too, as we saw when um, IASA t took off, it acquired many companies. Where are you in that kind of uh, status? Do you feel that your acquisitions are done, or will we see you continue to pull more and more companies in as you have to kind of step up your technology offerings? I would say uh, right now, uh, in, a, in a word, I have shifted my focus from top line growth to bottom line growth, uh, simply put. I want, I, we, over the last 10 years, we needed to grow to get to critical mass so we could be a global player. We achieved that, and now we're at a size where one of the you know one of the majors. If you get, if we were to get uh, you know twice as big by acquisition, we would probably have resistance from our customers because they don't want any one supplier to have too much of their business. They kind of like to break it up into at least into thirds, if you will. And we have, so we have the critical mass. And uh, the, the, now the exception to what I just said is uh, more than half the world's automobiles are made in Asia today. I mean, it astounds me, given where it was when I you know, first came into this industry, when more than half the world's automobiles are made right here in the US. But we are relatively underrepresented in Asia. We started with zero 10 years ago, and we've grown it to where we've got, uh, you know, I, forget, but 20 or so plants in Asia, but it is still only about 10% of our global business, and yet that's where half the world's cars are made. So if I were to predict where we're gonna be uh, going forward, it would be to uh, rapidly grow uh, our footprint in Asia to, to match where the customers are. You mentioned margins. I should have looked this up ahead of time, but where are your margins today and where would you really like to get them to and in what time frame? Our margins reflect the you know, recent history of the interiors business, which is slender, <laughs> single digit, uh, low single digit margins. Uh, and uh, I would hope uh, over the next few years uh, in running this company to uh, double the margins that uh, we get. Uh, just by, and largely by being more efficient at what we do. Um, uh, with the, the right deals, with the right uh, customers, and the right uh, focus in our plants, uh, we, we can do a lot better, not by, you know, not by taking price out of our customers' hides, but by taking cost out of our own situation. Are there any um, technologies that you see on the horizon in your company, in, in, you know, within your uh, development labs that make you very hopeful about some, you know, some additional revenue stream coming on. A lot of your parts tend to be commodities, center consoles, door trims, headliners, flooring, carpets, stuff that has to go in cars. Um, and you know, in the powertrain world, if you started making turbochargers and turbochargers were popular, you were making money on turbos. So do you see something like that, in, you know, anything coming along the line within your product tech, you know, uh, portfolio that you think is really gonna boost the bottom line? Well, here's what uh, I think is the opportunity for a company like ours with the technology that we have and the research labs that we have. And that is to make our products much more effective and, and uh, cost effective and uh, uh, lighter weight. The car makers, I mean the, the pressure on the automakers to get weight out of the car in order to uh, meet the mileage standards or the demands of customers is just incredible. And so every ounce that you can take out matters. Uh, I'll give you an example, like one of our big businesses is called flooring and acoustics. The part you see is the surface of the carpet. The part you don't see is all the acoustic material underneath. Uh, you know, in days gone by, what you did is you got like a, you know, an inch thick pad of acoustical material, you know, behind the carpet and just put it everywhere. We now have these labs and these sensors that tell you exactly where is the noise getting from the engine compartment into the car or the road into the car. And then specifically design a variable thickness of the padding so that you put the exact material where it's needed to maximize your acoustical control but minimize the total weight and total cost that's going into it. So if you look at the back of a carpet, 
carpet, you know, you see. It's not a flat pad anymore. It's long. not a yeah. flat pad. It is actually pieces here and there as needed to uh, perform the task. And that takes a lot of, you know, scientific uh, testing in the labs to figure that out. You know, some have said with, with the rise of a talk about autonomous that it really has shifted the focus on how the person interacts with the car and the interiors. And yeah. it sounds like, I guess, what are you being pushed to do now to, to think about the occupant and in a much different way? Someone had said, you know, now we're starting to think about how is the driver spending its time not driving if there's more autonomy? So I guess, is, there, is this giving rise to these technologies to push to focus more on comfort or where, where do you find kind of on the, the cutting edge yeah. out there? Well, the, the, the biggest single change that is coming, perhaps slower than many people would be talking about it, is uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Because remember, an awful lot about what goes into the science of interiors today is enhancing the experience of the driver, okay? Well, if the driver becomes a computer chip mm -hmm. and the rest of the vehicle is a living room, that completely changes the dynamic of what would make a, an elegant, uh, uh, luxurious interior for the people that are gonna occupy that vehicle. It's gonna have to be more durable. Autonomous cars will probably get more heavily used they may be, you know, they may be going day and night run by Uber or whoever, and, uh, and that means you need a very durable thing so it doesn't look beat up after the first month in service. And uh, those are kind of the, mac you know, major changes coming. I, you know, we've got time to figure that out because I don't, I don't see drivered cars being replaced uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, but over time, that is, you know, a futuristic uh, focus for us. Right now, the, the, you know, kind of the current to intermediate term is all about how can we make something that looks and feels as good, but at half the weight and half the cost that's in there now. Do you think you'd be willing at some point to place your life in the hands of a self-driving car? Well, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I have did, uh, while I was running Delphi a decade ago, uh, did, uh, ride around in some cars where it uh, had the electronic uh, capability to keep its distance and speed relative to the car in front and so on you know and and you know and I'm sitting in the driver's seat and the technician with me says okay now don't touch the brakes and you know when that car up front slows down you know you're it's very hard to resist the temptation so it, you know, I'm sure it'll be nerve-wracking at the beginning until people get used to the idea you know, going back to Delphi, I mean, you were there as you were leading Delphi through bankruptcy and you brought in a lot of changes dealing with the union, dealing with costs and all of that as you kind of set that company back up. Can you kind of paint the picture today? I mean, is the Detroit of today something that you envisioned it was going to be going to, much more competitive, a UAW that seems more open to changing things than it was back then? Where? Do you think it has evolved, or what, what, what is your perception? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I am pleasantly surprised that despite the trauma of 08-09, uh, when we saw you know, our premier institutions like GM and Chrysler go into Chapter 11, uh, they, they, they survived that in style and I think are much better uh, led and managed uh, these days. And yes, I mean, the UAW had to take a difficult, uh, bitter pill going through that to, you know, give up, you know, what they had spent uh, half a century building. But, uh, you know, they did it in order to protect the job base that they needed to. Because uh, otherwise, you know, these companies might have completely disappeared. So uh, I'm pleased with the outcome. I, I mean, I, I was last here living in Detroit uh, in 09. Right, right. And this was a very depressing place back in 09, as you can That's imagine. Cool. Right. Right. And today, you know, uh, I went to three restaurants last night because I couldn't get in because they were full. <laughs> <laughs> that little anecdote as to uh, the kind of a measure of it, but it, the place seems much more vibrant and optimistic and, um, and it's also, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of the world's supply base, you know, have set up their uh, headquarters here we've got uh, other automakers setting up tech centers in the uh, Detroit Ann Arbor area and so on. So 
uh, Detroit, you know, as a metaphor for a center of the automotive industry, has clearly maintained that position uh, as one of the world's centers for the automotive industry, which is, you know, the uh, one of the most important things in any the life of any individual. Steve, and yet, and I agree with you, I've never seen the economic vibrancy in the automotive industry like I'm seeing right now. It's incredible. And those who made it through the Great Recession, they're good to go. They can compete with anyone in the world. And yet Wall Street disparages the automotive industry. General Motors is trading at something like four times earnings, five times earnings. Ford's doing a little bit better. As you know, those are miserable valuations for these companies. Sergio Marchion from FCA is going wrong. Hey, confessions of a capital junkie. If we don't improve our margins, the money people are going to take their money and invest elsewhere where they can make much better returns. What's your long-term outlook? Can the auto industry address this issue? Can we get valuations at least up to the market average, which would triple GM stock? Well, uh, I happen to be on the board of a company out in Silicon Valley. It's called Symantec, which is the internet security company. Uh, and I got to say, I get whiplash when I go out there because all anybody out there can talk about is valuation multiples of revenue, okay? <laughs> and, you know, let alone multiples of, uh, of earning power. Uh, but a hard fact is that uh, the auto industry is hugely capital intensive. Uh, your planning cycles are very long. You make your bets today on vehicles you'll be selling five years from now and you have to put the capital behind it before you ever see the first dollar of revenue. So the whole notion of being nimble is inhibited by just the cycle time of the auto industry. We are also very cyclical. You know, when the economy turns down, people put off their purchase of a new vehicle uh, and ride the, the used vehicle for another year or so. And that is just punitive to the financial stability of the automakers. And I think that's the reason why the multiples are low. And I don't see that changing because it's too much in the nature of our business uh, to, to be capital intensive and highly cyclical. So what, what, what fixed costs. will the money people say, well then if you're never gonna improve your margins, we're gonna take our money elsewhere and invest it where we can get good returns. Well, you know, it, at, at a multiple of four times earnings, it's pretty attractive to put your money into it. So I think, Access to capital is not the issue. I think uh, it's uh, the the challenge for the automakers is to make sure they main they don't get carried away in good times and lever themselves up to where they tip over in uh, tough times. Uh, and that's that's kind of the one lesson that I learned, you know, starting in my early days at Ford and Chrysler was uh, you should be the squirrel that wants a few more nuts in the tree to get through the winter, whatever mm -hmm. that might be coming. You mentioned, uh, you know, as John mentioned, you know, you, your history tends to be arriving at companies in distress that need some help. And I don't think there was a mention of uh, Bethlehem Steel or Federal Mogul also. Um, so is it fair to say that this is the easiest job that you've landed in in your uh, career? <laughs> well, it's still, it, every job is either tough or easy, uh, depending on, you know, how you want to react to it. This is the one that in terms of, you know, fundamental, you know, condition of the company, market position, everything else has uh, been in the, you know, the best shape of anything I have seen compared to the other uh, train wrecks I got involved in. Uh, but it's still a very tough, competitive business. Our margins, uh, as you pointed out, you know, are still relatively low compared to other companies. And, and I just think there's so much opportunity here to make this company so much better uh, that it's kind of exciting to work on something that's pretty good and try and make it terrific and excellent, uh, as opposed to going into something that's, you know, half destroyed and, and then I declare victory merely by the fact of survival. Can you say also why some of the uh, world's billionaires such as uh, Wilbur Ross, uh, Icon, um, you know, uh, Warren Buffett, they like to play in this space, this auto space. Is there something that that, that is attractive when you talk to Wilbur in that? What, why does he still like this uh, spot? And if it's something that doesn't really generate those high pro profit margins? Well, if you look at what Wilbur uh, has been into, he's been into coal mines, he's been into textiles, he's been into the steel business, which is where I got to know him, by the way, because uh, ended up merging Bethlehem Steel with uh, what had been called LTV, which he had bought. <laughs> um, 
and it, you know those those mills are now all part of ArcelorMittal. Uh, but uh, you know the attraction is uh, if you see an industry that's out of favor, where the valuations are you know very low, you know then there's an attractive way to invest, fix it up with the right management, and make some money out of it. Steve, we're getting down to the very end here, so I'll just need a quick answer, unfortunately. But do you find it easier to fix a company that's broken than to maintain one that's running relatively well? Uh, short answer is yes. If a company is truly broken, it uh, quite often ends up in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy case, and then, then you don't have to apologize for anything. You can just be focused on how do I make uh, lemonade out of this lemon. Yeah, it seems to me that in a crisis like that, Everybody's very focused yep. at that point. A lot of arguments yep. end. Steve Miller, thanks so much for coming in. I think we got a little bit of a business lesson as well as learning a lot more about IAC. It's terrific to have you on the show again. John, thank you very much, and thank you both for the questions. Thanks. And of course, I want to thank Jeff Bennett from uh, the Wall Street Journal, Tom Murphy from Wards Auto. Always great having you guys on thank the show you. as well. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in today. I hope you learned as much as I did because I learned a ton. And be sure to go join us again next week for another edition of out of line this week. Underwriting for Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner.